The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. This is Debbie Hart. I'm the President and CEO of BioNJ. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our webinar presented in conjunction with new BioNJ member, uh, market maker member, Fisher Scientific. As an active member of our community, Fisher Scientific has been a longtime supporter of BioNJ and partner through our purchasing consortium, and we'd like to thank them for the support for today's webinar. So at BioNJ, we're very excited to be growing our membership, allowing us to foster new relationships, offer new educational programs such as today's, and to support New Jersey's vibrant life sciences ecosystem. So an essential topic, today's webinar will review industry best practices for evaluating and ensuring that your lab facilities are compliant with HASCOM and existing chemical hygiene standards. So our experts today will dis discuss the importance of safety, HASCOM compliance and your lab, PPE equipment and best practices, considerations when choosing a safety partner. And we'll end with a case study where hopefully we can see implemented the kinds of things that we've discussed on the call today. So before we get started, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. This is a listen-only webinar, and we encourage you to submit questions via the dialog box on your computer screen. We have a good-sized group on the line, and we'll try to get as many of your questions as possible at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to your question, We'll follow up with you after the webinar. There will be a recording of this webinar on the BioNJ website at bionj.org beginning tomorrow. So today's presenters are Tim Van Hoke, the Senior Program Manager for Safety for Thermo Fisher Scientific. Tim has been with Fisher Scientific for 15 years, entirely in the environmental health and safety field. He develops and supports all training programs for Fisher Safety Team to ensure that our customers, their customers, meet new and existing compliance standards. And then we'll hear from Steve Sampson, the National Accounts Program Manager for Lab and Healthcare at Brady Corporation. Steve has been with Brady for nearly three years in a variety of roles, including safety-focused inside sales specialist and distribution channel program manager. In his current position, Steve works closely with Fisher Scientific to heighten field engagement and to provide training. I'd like to welcome both Tim and Steve, and thank you for the, to them for being with us today. And now, please, Tim, welcome, and uh, why don't you get the party started, please? All right, great. Thank you very much, Debbie, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with uh, BioNJ today. Very much appreciated. Um, I th hopefully you'll find a lot of our content here to be kind of a fresh look at, at your HASGOM programs and your safety programs and best practices. At Thermo Fisher Scientific, our key mission that we are very proud of is that we enable our customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. And of course, today we're going to have uh, predominantly a focus on the safer piece of that mission statement. Next slide, please. So talking about the importance of safety, uh, traditionally a lot of folks look at safety and of course the, the number one uh, key component of safety is protecting your people as your most important assets. You also need to worry about protecting your property. Uh, you don't want uh, damaged facilities or damaged equipment. But a couple of other considerations to, to take it, to consider are the, uh, the, the importance of the public trust and reputations. We live in a global market now, we operate in a global market now. And so much more, it's so important to make sure that you've partnered with people that have great risk management programs um, themselves, that they have risk avoidance in place. Because with today's social media and how quickly news travels, um, a bad incident is, is quickly spread throughout our industry. And of course, you want to make sure that you're protecting your profits or your operating budget. Um, regulatory requirements are always a concern, be it uh, OSHA or the, uh, the EPA or the NFPA standards. Um, there are actually new developments in safety that actually enable improvements and possibly to your processes and production through technology and innovation um, that, can, that can help save you money and make you more, more profitable as well. Next slide, please. 
So the potential financial impacts to your business or your organization, as I mentioned on the earlier slide, you can't put a price on a human life. Protecting employees is always the first consideration. But if you're either a, an organization that's for profit or whether or not you're a, a new organization or a smaller organization that's worried about budget or capital investments, um, a safety incident can, can have a huge impact. And there is actually a formula out there for this. It's called sales equivalent dollars. And sales equivalent dollars is the total cost times 100% divided by whatever your profit margin is or it could be based on what your operating budget is. So in this example, you take a, an injury of $500 of a direct cost injury. Well, you can immediately multiply that times two, uh, and that would be the indirect cost. You know, if you're curious as far as what the indirect cost of this is, it could be wages of the injured person, injuries to other people, administrative costs, or product or pro property or product damages. So in this example here, we're looking at sales equivalent of dollars of $1,500. But when you multiply that times 100%, and then if the company is working off pretty lean margins of, of 5%, or if you've got an operating budget for your capital investments, you're now looking at a difference that may have to be made up of $30,000. And then in today's world, um, that could be 6,000 cups of premium coffee, uh, 60,000 donuts, or even more so within the realm that we're discussing today, 300,000 uh, exam gloves. Next slide, please. So looking back at 2016, and I can tell you having just attended the NSC in Indianapolis this week, there's not much change here. Uh, these were the top 10 serious violations of 2016. So when you look at these, which one of these would fall within the laboratory space? Well, of course, fall protection, um, HASCOM, uh, respiratory protection, potentially lockout, tag out, and, and what's really kind of cropped up here recently is not just fall, fall protection, but fall protection training. Keeping in mind that fall protection uh, violations are not just falling from height, but actually falling on level surfaces from slick floors. And these are all defined as a serious violation where there's a substantial probability that death or serious physical harm could result. Next slide, please. <coughs> Additionally, I don't know if everyone's aware, but OSHA did recently um, raise the allowance for maximum penalties. In 2015, Congress enacted legislation actually requiring the federal agencies to adjust their civil penalties. Uh, OSHA's maximum penalties increased by actually 78%, and going forward, uh, they'll be adjusted annually by the Consumer Pricing Index. We get called in a lot of times, unfortunately, to assist customers after something bad has already happened and we're looking for how to prevent it from happening again. And I can tell you from my experience and what I've seen that the daily cost to our customers for a comprehensive safety program is actually pennies compared to the cost of a serious one-time workplace injury or death. Next slide, please. So HASCOM compliance in your lab. Next slide. Um, depending on, everyone has different views of how they looked at their safety programs. What we have found to be most beneficial and a best practice to our customers is kind of break out the requirements that exist. So we promote safety to our customers and encourage them to use something called the four pillars of safety. Just quickly reviewing these, those pillars are prepare, prevent, protect, and respond. In the prepare pillar, you would be looking at training for your employees, auditing of your existing programs and your facilities, and what additional services might you need to be prepared for what you do within your facility. And the prevent pillar then, after you've looked at these things and done the audits, what do you need in the lab that will keep you as safe as possible? Could it be signs, hazardous storage, sanitizers, wipers, disposals, or waste disposal items? Protect, of course, is a PPE personal protective equipment, which would predominantly be thought of as eye, hand, and body, but there's also face, hearing, head, respiratory, matting, ergonomics, or potential monitoring. And then finally, if you've done the first three well, hopefully this doesn't arise too often, but the fourth pillar is the respond pillar. And in the response, that could be first aid kits, AEDs, emergency lighting, or spill control. Unfortunately, at times, even with the best preparations, you're going to be able to have, you're going to have to have planned out how you're going to re respond to an incident within your facility. 
Next slide. <clears throat> so what are your lab hazards? Um, labs are different. You might have chemical hazards, biological hazards, viruses with bacteria, um, thermal hazards, which could be fire, arc flash, or cryogenic hazards. Uh, every lab usually oftentimes is overlooked. There are actually physical hazards, be it from noise, heat, or cold. And then finally, safety hazards, slippery, uneven surfaces, moving or unstable surfaces, or, or problems with power sources. Next slide. So to start with, you need to evaluate the hazards. And in evaluate, evaluating the hazards, you have to know what the process is that you're doing within the facility or within a particular lab. It's important, especially as EH&S professionals that, and as the potentially principal person in charge of that area, that you observe the work practices. Determine the level of the hazard, the duration of the hazard, and the frequency of your employee's exposure to the hazards. Uh, at this point, you ought to be looking to determine if there are engineering or administrative controls that are not being used that might be utilized to help uh, reduce or eliminate the hazard. Also, if, if PPE is your only option, you need to determine and evaluate the effectiveness of the personal protective equipment that you're using. Um, every lab should have a chemical hygiene plan. This is for the OSHA 1910-1450. Uh, with a lot of the changes that have come out recently with GHS and other programs, these should be looked at as living programs. I know processes change in labs, new people come in, new employees, um, there might be new elements or chemicals introduced in the lab. So um, it's not really a write at one time and put it away type of program. Think of it as a living program. Next slide. So when you do your hazard assessments, remember your, your hazard assessment is not just for the laboratory, but is also should be done for your entire facility or complex, including administrative areas, common areas, production or maintenance areas. Again, a best practice is can you substitute re to reduce or eliminate the hazard? Is there an engineering solution or a technical solution to make the equipment safer? Is there a way of changing your work practices or scheduling so that the exposure level is not as high? And then finally, remember that personal protective equipment is the last line of defense, of defense if the other three options won't work for you. Next slide. So with HASCOM and G GHS, we're going to touch on GHS a little bit because it seems, still seems to be a little bit of a hot button with some of our customers currently. We all know that back in June of 2016, everyone should have been compliant at that point. But just as a quick reminder, it is part of your HAZCOM program, and it ensures that the dangers of all your hazardous chemicals used are known by all affected employees, which is going to require revised uh, container labeling. So you're going to have to change your container labels, your primary containers, and then retrain your folks. Uh, material safety data sheets are changing from MSDSs to just safety data sheets, and they're more streamlined and standardized now. Uh, again, you get new employees in, you get new chemicals, it's going to require employee training and, and additional information for them, so make sure that's updated. Make sure you also review your hazardous non-routine tasks, those things that maybe aren't an everyday process. Uh, your list of hazardous chemicals need to be updated at least annually. And a common myth that we found at times is some facilities have chemicals that run throughout the facility in pipes. So when you're doing your GHS labeling, uh, you need to make sure that, that you're looking for correcting or adding labels to those pipes as well. And remember, your HASCOM program must be made available upon request to your employees and their representatives. Next slide. So where are companies at based on a recent poll uh, regarding GHS compliance? Well, surprisingly enough, only about 37% felt they were third, uh, completely and fully compliant. 55% uh, thought that they were partially compliant, and about 8.5% either didn't know or felt they weren't compliant at all. So as you, you can see, based on this recent poll, there's still some work to do. Next slide. Uh, there are best practices available. Uh, there are organizations that can come out and do help you do a, a GHS survey, assist you with sourcing um, equipment if needed to print your own labels or ordering labels or setting up your SDS binder stations. It's funny, um, a couple of the, of the challenges the folks said they were having regarding getting compliant GHS was finding label materials that would withstand the environment. 
finding appropriate printers to print GHS compliance labels, um, or uh, not aware of the GHS labeling requirements. And the training of workers actually was, was number one. So again, there are solutions that are out there, be it external surveys uh, and labeling options. Next slide. Now we're gonna move on to auditing your, your laboratory. Um, I've seen a lot of programs out there, so let's kind of review first what the purpose of your internal audits are. Well, number one, again, is to protect people, your property, is to make sure you're, you're meeting and improving compliance, uh, improving your safety practices, and the bottom line is you want to make sure you identify issues and you reduce risk. Next slide. So how do you prepare to audit? Uh, here's some key questions that you should be asking yourself. Uh, what is my current level of, of perceived compliance that I have? What is my overall risk? What is the greatest risk in my facility? How frequently do I audit? What is my audit method? A lot of folks are still using pen and paper. How many work areas do I have to audit? And do I actually need to hire an outside resource or consultant to come in and do the auditing? It's nice to look at every audit with, with kind of a, a fresh, like you're doing it for the first time type deal. It can be very easy to check the box on something that you may have done several times. Next slide. Um, best practices. There are actually some automated solutions available that can provide expedited and more frequent auditing. Uh, a lot of these programs can be done on your own um, iPads or smartphones or smart devices. Uh, they can come available preloaded with regulatory content. They can also come loaded with state, local, or, or even company policies and protocol regarding the safety program. And what's nice and a, are a lot of them are becoming simple enough now that they can actually be completed by non-EHNS people because you're literally just answering questions, checking the box, and taking pictures as you go through the checklist. Um, a benefit of this as well is that there's automated reporting capabilities and it allows you to assign and track discrepancies um, after you've done an audit uh, within one of your facilities. So if you're using pen and paper now, if you can't get the auditing quick enough, um, there are actually automated solutions that are out there available to you. Next slide. When we go out and work with customers, a lot of times walk through the labs. This is a very nice, very streamlined, very clean looking lab. You'd be amazed what we see missing in there a lot of times. The obvious items we see, which traditionally are the last resort, are eye, hand, and body protection. But in this picture, you don't see a first aid kit, an eye washer, a shower, a spill response kit, fire blankets, uh, floor mats for ergonomic purposes, um, chemical storage cabinets. So again, as, as you go through and, and, and you look at how compliant your labs are, um, a clean lab doesn't always mean it's the safest lab. Next slide, please. Uh, moving on to PPE and best practices. Next slide. So how do you look at your primary PPE versus secondary PPE? Um, our approach to working with our customers to keeping them safe is, is to kind of look at the PPE in those two different categories. In the upper half of the slide, you'll see that this is primary protective equipment. When this gentleman puts on his bunker gear, and he's rushing to the fire, he knows that the hazard is already active and his exposure to the hazard is imminent. But if you look down below at secondary protective equipment, this is a worst case or what if garment that this gentleman's wearing. It's, it's a Nomex Arc Flash maintenance uniform. When he got up in the morning, he didn't think I'm gonna go to work today and get electrocuted, but he knew during his chores of the day, he may be called upon to be exposed to what might be the, the, the worst possible uh, incident, which could be an arc flash. So just in case he has on the proper secondary equipment. So when you look in your lab facilities, um, look at what could be the what if or the worst case scenario, what's the exposure level or the duration of the exposure and are your folks adequately protected? Next slide. Um, eye protection. Um, always a big issue every year in 2012, there were 24,000 eye injuries. The average cost of an eye injury is about $1,486 and two to three days away from work. Um, if you go talking about vision loss, which we hope would, would be horrible, the direct and indirect cost can be anywhere from 56,000 to 118,000. Um, in this case, going back to our sales equivalent dollars of how it would affect your budget, 
um, it could total about $1.7 million, just as an example of a customer working off a 7% margin rate. So again, safety can impact your bottom line. And it's important to remember you only have one set of eyes. Next slide. Um, OSHA has a great table, it's called the E1 table. Uh, within laboratories, you'll see looking at this chart that for chemical handling and for laboratory, in most cases, you should have goggles on and potentially a face shield. Um, remember, a face shield is a secondary protective item. It, it is not a standalone eye protection item. And that eye injuries happen not only because of lack of eyewear, but incorrect eyewear protection. Um, we're finding more and more as we educate our customers that they are moving away from just spectacles to goggles or spectacles with the face shield um, or goggles with the face shield. Next slide. Um, there are solutions out there as well. Some common complaints with over the glasses. Glasses are lack of sizes uh, for ladies or poor fit on workers with wider noses or smaller faces. There are also issues with depth perception, headaches, and nausea. Uh, prescription eyewear can eliminate this because you're removing that second layer of, of glass that, that may be causing an issue for the employee. Next slide. Uh, gloves, very personal PPE selection item. Um, of course, identifying the hazard is paramount. Uh, you might have exposure to biologicals, chemicals, cuts, or extreme temps. Um, the type of gloves, of course, ex are disposable, chemical resistant, cut resistant, or maybe even uh, thermal or cryogenic gloves. Uh, considerations that are important always are the thickness that are re is required, the length, the cuff, and the hand uh, style of the glove. Next slide. Um, a safety data sheet is always the first and usually best place to find a suggestion for which glove material is appropriate. Prior to selecting any glove, always check the manufacturer's data in the glove thickness, and gloves should always be inspected before each use. Next slide. Uh, this is very important right here. Um, every manufacturer that's out there will have a permeation, breakthrough, and degradation chart for their gloves. I know there's a lot of uh, competitive gloves that are out there in the market, but if you are the end user responsible for the, for the safety of your employees, um, make sure and ask the manufacturer or the, or the supplier of the glove for this information. It's usually available online, but you want to make sure you validate that what you may be potentially switching the glove out um, on based on cost is going to continue to uh, protect your employees. Next slide. Uh, chemical protective apparel considerations. Um, again, why do you need them? Is it just for a repellency? Um, are you concerned about penetration of particles or liquids? Um, what permeation concerns do you have for hazardous toxic liquids and gases? Um, it's always great if you have the CAS number and the concentration level of the chemical. Um, honestly, evaluate whether or not you're worried about just incidental contact or is there a splash hazard. Uh, again, going back to evaluating the work process, the volume or the duration of exposure, and is there going to be direct contact? Uh, more and more, we're getting questions these days regarding flame resistant or FR protection. And again, you're looking, are you worried about um, primary FR uh, protection or just secondary flame resistance? Um, a lot of folks always ask the question too, is can you layer um, a chemical protective garment with a flame resistant garment? Um, the answer to that is pretty much no. You will not find a supplier out there that will that will give you guidance to layer a, uh, a garment because you're now trying to predict what order that that hazard might hit you in. Next slide. Um, biological protective apparel. Um, again, biologicals can adversely affect human health in several ways, ranging from relatively mild allergic reactions to serious medical condi conditions or even death. If a lab is following biosafety level protocols, the, your PPE should be written into the process, which will also include the training procedures. So this is very important. Next slide. Um, new technologies that's available. I just talked a moment ago about um, flame resistant garments. Uh, there is actually a garment manufactured by Workright that's out there. I'm not doing a commercial for them. I'm just saying that they're the only ones that pretty much have it right now, and you can get it from a variety of sources. 
Um, but this garment actually has a Nomex 3A flame resistance, but and also chemical splash protection. They can provide you the permeation degradation data as well as far as what chemicals it will protect you from. It's all in one garment. It's very lightweight and breathable. It's designed for lab workers and it can be laundered repeatedly. So again, if you're looking for a best practice and you have both flame resistant chemical protection uh, concerns, this item may be something you wanna consider. Next slide. Considerations when choosing a safety provider. Next slide. It's very important, whoever you're working with for safety and whoever you're using to get your items from, that they un understand your process and solutions, that they actively work to help you to maintain safe workplaces as opposed to waiting for you to bring them opportunities, that their number one concern is protecting what matters most, your most valuable resource, your employees, that they realize the importance of efficiency for your organization and can deliver compliant products and services. If they have um, a team of safety specialists that are focused strictly on that, that is definitely a benefit as well. Next slide. Um, there are services and solutions beyond the product that are available to you out there. A lot of these are available at no charge. Some have costs associated with them, but there are uh, some available that um, industry experts or subject matter experts can come to your facility and exist. And these categories could be in safety training, lab and facility safety audits, uh, GHS and HASCOM programs, hand protection evaluations, chemical flammable storage assessments, and even recycling programs for your gloves and garments. Uh, we work with a lot of strategic partners that lead the industry in compliance, and we would be happy to make them your resources as well. Next slide. So in summary, uh, the safest workplaces include a top-down safety culture, um, hazard and process assessments that are continual, strong employee safety training, proper PPE selection, frequent safety auditing, continuous process improvements to improve your facility and your safety program, and of course, enforcement of existing compliance programs. And the, I think the most important item that's on here is a top-down safety culture. The more you can involve the leadership with your, in your organization, with not only the program itself, but what the negative effects can be if your program is not up to speed, um, the more you send a positive and, and, and more cohesive message uh, to the folks you're trying to protect, that safety is important in your workplace. Next slide. So at this time, I'm very happy uh, to turn the presentation over to Steve Sampson. Steve is with Brady Corporation. Steve will be reviewing some case studies uh, for you today that will improve safety and compliance in your lab. And um, Steve, thank you very much for joining us. I'm hand the call over to you now. Awesome. All right, are you guys able to hear me? All right, excellent. I got the thumbs up. Very cool. So thanks so much for the great insight, Tim. You laid it out very thoroughly. Um, there are many safety pain points that affect organizations on multiple levels. Most important reason organizations are adopting this vision for safety programs is to ensure that employees are able to go home safely after a day's work. While that overarching you know, implementation is second to none, there are other aspects that Tim touched on uh, that can really benefit an organization uh, when an environment of safety is adopted. So I'd like to I'd like to uh, outline some of the some of the ways uh, you can protect employees, property, public trust, profits, et cetera, All of those all of those pillars of safety. And next slide, please. Awesome. Um, so. What, I, what I'd like to do is outline kind of the, the, different, the different work areas that uh, many Bio New Jersey uh, organizations uh, might work within on a daily basis. You know, take for example, uh, production and manufacturing area of a laboratory. Uh, there are machines that need maintenance that require lockout preparation and lockout tagout equipment. You know, individual procedure processes, training for employees, just to ensure that safety, that, that there's safe operation of these machines. And when maintenance does need to occur, uh, you you have a procedure in place in order to uh, in order to to facilitate that maintenance. You know, one accident can not only injure an employee, can also take a machine down and put it take it out of production, hurting timelines. You know, displacing customer experience, uh, ultimately hurting profits. Uh, another area, inventory and storage, uh, it, where where an, an area where small visual improvements can create a safer environment and a more efficient working environment, because safety and efficiency tend to run hand in hand. Uh, so when everything is labeled and everything has its place, 
you're able to minimize mistakes in the storage process. Uh, you're able to create an efficient environment that's easily navigated uh, for, for new employees or current employees. And just, just to ensure that employees know uh, where everything is, not to mention what materials they're working with, what they're handling. Um, so all of those things being, being accurately labeled really help to, to um, enable a, a facility to be even more safe. Shipping and receiving area is another spot where small visual improvements can go a long way to protect people, property, profits. When visual, when visual hazard communication is instated, it ensures that employees are, are aware of their environment and the hazard or hazards around it. Be it visual communication like signage indicating tripping hazards, marking things like forklift lanes, um, or, or even, even being proactive. Uh, with with being prepared for a spill for spills, um, these protections keep employees safe and ensure that accidents are minimized just simply by proactive visual communication. Something as simple as that, just instating visual workplace so everything has a place. There's a place for everything, and there isn't a, it isn't a guessing game as to the dangers uh, or or. Uh, uh, cautions that should be had uh, in an environment. So our final two uh, areas of of, uh, of of work areas um, kind of segue into our case studies. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. We'll start with uh, with an actual laboratory uh, area of the facility. Um, protecting the integrity and the accuracy as, of a study directly impacts the profitability and reputation of an organization. Um, on top of protect uh, on top of protecting that that accuracy of the study, um, visual communications really help to ensure employees are familiar with what's with what specimens they're working with, the content, um, and you know being able to decipher where those those samples should go or what they're being used for. Um, so uh, the, the case study that I'd like to outline is is for a biotech partner um, that uh, that had a, had a challenge in the discovery process. Uh, they were they were using printers and automatic inline applicators um, to to apply apply materials to, to samples. Um, uh, labeling materials to samples, um, but the, the issue was that the labels were falling off when the when the samples were exposed to liquid nitrogen. Uh, they wouldn't stay adhered, and the material wasn't an exact fit for their automated system. So they wanted to streamline this process with uh, with with a with a new material with a with a with the technology in place to be able to implement barcodes. It had to be super user friendly due to the diverse work, uh, the the diverse staff that would be working in that in that area. Um, so the, the the challenge was 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 had had quite a few uh, quite a few arms to it. So um, the solution was uh, uh, coming up with a label material that could withstand liquid nitrogen and uh, extremely low temperatures for long periods of time that would be able to adhere to samples and stay adhered to samples. Also to uh, adhere to those clinical trial kits as well. Uh, so the, the printing solutions that in place needed to also be able to switch sizes of materials and formats easily um, to implement these 2D barcodes. Um, so these, the, and these templates also had to be compliant. Compliance is a, is a big piece to the, lab, to the lab industry as well. Uh, and finally, with software, uh, they, they were using a, a, a limb system and uh, needed, needed to be able to input data and pull data from that system um, on, on a two-way street. So they needed a, a solution that could provide labels, provide printers, and provide the, the software automation to integrate, uh, integrate into, their, uh, into, their, into their system. So the result was great. The result was once, once a new solution is implemented uh, with, a, with a trusted safety partner, they're able to imp improve quality, reduce costs, uh, really, really implement a, a, a lean, a lean mentality uh, where there's a place for everything and everything is labeled. They were able to save time, reduce errors, um, and they were compliant at the end of the day. So that was the, that was the big piece. They wanted to set themselves up for the future in order to in order to be able to label, track, um, and uh, and ensure that these labels stayed on efficiently. So um, the, it was it was a service based need in uh, in in the case where this where the safety partner had to really design an entire an entire solution for them and really take a take a look at their process and their workflow uh, to really understand where their bottlenecks are and uh, develop a solution that could that could cross uh, multiple multiple different different organ or excuse me multiple different locations um, and, uh, and and different audiences as well. So that thankfully that 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 process went went very smoothly and uh, there was with with this new material that was developed uh, it was also implemented 
in, a, in an inkjet material to be able to print color and uh, label their uh, clinical trial kits with, uh, with, with GHS labels. Um, a GHS being a, a big piece that, that Tim outlined for us earlier. So, which kind of segues us right into, into our, final, our, our final case study for the day um, uh, regarding GHS labels. Uh, so, so what what this what this case study really puts into practice are some of the GHS standards that Tim had outlined earlier. Um, the pillars of safety uh, that GHS supports are directly correlated to the challenges that organizations are dealing with. Uh, organizations that deal with chemicals are seeing kind of on a daily basis. Um, due to the due to the new OSHA standard uh, for chemical storage, I believe it was 1910 uh, 1450. Um, the 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 issues were compliance. Uh, new new standards required organizations to to kind of readdress and reassess their their GHS and chemical hygiene plan. So this was a, a pharmaceutical company uh, that uh, that had some had some challenges uh, when it came to being compliant. Uh, they had, were updating their entire GHS program to uh, adhere to the new standard. So they needed they needed to ensure that they had the systems in place to to label. Uh, the chemicals that they produce for both shipping and uh, and uh, se secondary se secondary label applications, so primary and secondary. The struggle that they had, they didn't have the staff with the knowledge in place to implement these changes and really push forward with a new program. So, uh, so the 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 solution came in. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll touch on the, another challenge real quick, just because it is applicable when it comes to the response aspect. Um, with many granular uh, with gr many granular absorbents, there's a there's a risk of silica uh, in those granular absorbents, which make it a little more difficult to work with that, given the environment and having to you know put on a mask every time you have a spill. So the solution was 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 quite uh, was was quite simple. Um, so the in in going along with the prepare, prevent, protect, um, and uh, and respond uh, pillars of safety that that Tim had outlined. So the the prepare the preparedness was the organization was able to prepare by uh, by working with a trusted safety partner to kind of assess and update and implement this new uh, HASCOM program. Uh, so they, they worked with the safety expert uh, partner who were able to, to lend a hand with that. Um, they, they were able to prevent future, uh, future issues uh, by, by training the employees and implementing these new requirements um, where now, the, now that the, the system is in place and the, the program is in place, um, it's a sustainable program because we want it to be a living program that can be updated and that can be passed down to, to employees as new employees come up. Uh, so as new employees as new employees begin to work for the organization, uh, we want to make sure that that the that the HASCOM and and, uh, and GHS uh, and GHS implementation is clear to them and and simple to learn. Then, then we when we go into protecting, you know, how do we protect them? In order to protect the employees beyond just this training, the, this organization needed solutions uh, to properly label all their primary and secondary GHS labels. By applying these labels, they're not only protecting employees by informing them of the contents of that of these of these uh, of these. Um, of these jars or, or vials, um, the, the, the there are pr correct precautions when handling um, that that are that are they're able to be informed on, so they can and then they can also take it a step further to take action in the event of exposure of this chemical. Um, so they're able to stay compliant by by being prepared, uh, by preventing these and then protecting themselves against it by by just labeling and visually communicating the hazards that 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 are around, and taking that visual communication a step further. You know, uh, taking it a step further into into response. You know, when when it comes to providing uh, when it comes to providing spill spill control, when it comes to providing absorbents, um, you know, improving this plan so that that slip trips and falls don't happen, and in the event that there is a, a is a spill, there's a there's a correct response. So, so the result of of this this case study was was pretty resounding. It was pretty great. Um, so we updated. So so the 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 safety partner was able to update and implement procedures for GHS and and uh, and chemical hygiene throughout their 13 locations. Um, again, leveraging safety partners with the expertise to, to be able to help them implement this and sustain this program. Sustainability, this was a sustainable program to ensure that all these employees were safe and one that could kind of be a living program to continue on toward the future. We saw cost improvements um, just with, uh, with being able to, to 
print their own label. So instead of having to print a laundry list of labels um, with a with a with a third party uh, organization, they were able to they were able to obtain a do it yourself. GHS printing solution, where instead of having to order labels or have that concern of oh OSHA is coming tomorrow, we need to have these labels. They were able to they were able to begin printing all of their own secondary and primary labels uh, using printers, um, software, and, uh, and and the software that that actually interfaces with MSDS online. Um, so so a, a kind of a, a full service solution in that regard. And then when it comes to the respond, um, the they were they were looking for for alternatives to to silica. Um, so we so the they 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 were looking for an all natural solution that was able to just be thrown away that didn't need you know masks and uh, and that sort of thing. So a, a solution for was spill fix, um, an all natural absorbent uh, that was able to that was able to minimize the the amount of amount of risk and uh, was all natural so it was able to just be kind of tossed in the garbage when it was done as opposed to as opposed to having to be a lot more careful with the exposure of the uh, of the of the chemicals so um, so those two case studies really kind of put into put into practice two scenarios in which um, in which labeling can really can really be a game changer when it comes to the safety uh, protecting property public trust reputation profits, all that kind of stuff, just to make sure that that all organizations are doing everything they can to be to be visually compliant and safe. Terrific, thank you, Steve. Thank you so much, and thank you to Tim as well. And we'll hear from Tim and Steve in a moment with some questions. Um, and so I would encourage each of you to, uh, if you have questions, to post them on the dialog box on your computer screen. And so. Um, we do have one to kick us off. So what sort of safety related red flags should we be looking for when walking through our labs? So Tim or Steve? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to take that one. This is Tim. Um, again, red flags, it's, it's great to go into your lab kind of with the perspective like you're going in there for the first time. Um, I find in a lot of labs, not so much in commercial, but but in other areas, you know, is is are people wearing uh, PPE? Is it the approved PPE that your folks um, are wearing? Uh, I know there's a lot of different uh, choices of, of safety glasses and items that are out there that are they look good, uh, but are they the right the right thing? Are, are lab coats are they completely buttoned up the way they should be? Are the sleeves the right length? Take a second look at what your folks are wearing, especially on their feet. Um, make sure they're wearing the approved footwear. That's something that often gets overlooked. But literally walk around your lab and kind of think to yourself as a, as a red flag, if I'm on this side of the lab, and this is an example, and the eye wash station is over there, if I've get, got something in my eye, can I make it from this point to the eye wash station, and what's in the way? Um, housekeeping is huge. Uh, I know I said earlier that oftentimes the cleanest labs aren't the safest labs, but there's really no such thing as a safe lab that has not got good housekeeping. So when I walk into a customer's facility, traditionally what I look at right away is I'm looking for labeling, I'm looking for information that I might need as just a visitor that would keep me safe. But you could start with housekeeping and PPE or two big red flags that a lot of times um, you might want to take kind of a fresh set of eyes and look at. Terrific. Thank you, Tim. Steve, anything you'd like to add to that? Tim pretty much hit it right on the head. You know, when 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 I think about walking into a lab, uh, at least in my in my in my lab experience, I think about how 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 close of quarters everything is, and how how there there's so much going on in a lab. Typically, not a lot of room for uh, for for additional things. So when it, when it comes to the 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 potential clutter of a lab, having labels on everything really, really takes a really takes the burden off of off of new employees coming in and, and, and wondering where everything goes um, or what hazards they should be aware of. So these visual communications really it, that's kind of the home run when it comes to when it comes to uh, taking a walk through a facility, you know, when, when if you have questions about where things are um, or if you have questions about about the, the safety hazards just as you're walking through, that's a great red flag just to make sure that there are there are, the hazards are communicated adequately be it with floor marking tape or, or anything like that where there's where there's a question of where are the hazards so visual communication and visual workplace is like the is is the main is the main piece that I that I think about when I walk into a lab terrific okay thank you thank you 
And so um, I understand that I think Brady and Fisher are both part of a GSA approved list of vendors. Um, and I and I'd like to ask you. I understand that there are some uh, some uh, support that our members might be able to access. Access that's um, free on site support uh, for potential safety engagement. Um, Tim or Steve, you want to talk about that for a moment? And again, I encourage the audience to post your questions, and we'll be happy to take them. Uh, hi, this is Tim. Regarding um, free online support, are you talking as it relates to GHS, uh, GSA, or are you talking as it relates to services that Fisher offers? Well, I mean either, uh, either or. You know, what, okay. what, uh, what kinds of what kinds of free on-site support could our could our members access? Okay, some some on-site support that you can access from us is, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we work closely with a lot of our manufacturers um, that, that will come out and provide uh, surveys. Uh, one of the more popular ones that we have is actually a, a storage transfer use disposal equipment survey. Uh, we work with a manufacturer called Just Right on this where they'll actually come out and take a look at your chemical programs to see how you're, how you're storing your chemicals. Uh, do you have enough uh, cabinets flammable? Are they vented correctly? Um, this is a no charge survey. We also work uh, with an eyewash station company called uh, Bradley. They'll come out to the facility. They'll do a full walk through. They'll look at where you have your eyewash stations located at. Are they are they properly spaced? Are they pro being properly maintained? Um, there are several suppliers out there, and actually a few of them now actually have online programs that you can access. Um, one of them is Ansel on hand protection. Uh, where you can sign up for this program, and regardless of the chemical you're working for, you can actually plug that chemical information into their program, and it will give you a list of gloves that will protect you against that chemical and that concentration, and will make that recommendation for you. So those are our three programs as far as a no charge coming out and supporting uh, the program. And then I, I can let uh, Steve talk a little bit. I know uh, Brady a lot of times has no charge surveys where they can come out and, and assist as well within your facilities. Absolutely, Tim, and thanks for thanks for kind of teeing that up for us. So, so Brady has uh, has has 80 plus outside sales reps that are that are able to more than sales reps. They're they're I guess consultants because they what what we'll do is we'll come into any facility um, and we'll do do a do a general walkthrough. Um, and, and kind of keeping in mind the, 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 the safety aspects that, that Brady can lend a hand with, but other that Fisher can also lend a hand with. Um, so just walking through that facility, uh, picking up on the, the, the visual cues, you know, thinking about arc flash, thinking about um, lockout, tagout. Um, there are so many aspects of safety that Brady kind of touches. And oftentimes the, with, without having a, having a rep on site, some of that stuff can get overlooked. So similar to what Fisher does where there are no charge uh, uh, kind of assessments and meetings, Brady is, is certainly, uh, certainly able to, to provide that as well. Terrific. Okay. Well, thank you both. And we have another question here. Um, so short, this is an interesting one. So short of writing people up, how how can we enforce PPE wear in non-compliant labs? I've, I've seen um, several different options on it. Um, a, a lot of times folks like to go with positive reinforcement. Uh, this could be something as simple as, as safety awards or catching somebody for being safe. Um, there's programs out there like near miss programs. Um, someone that is, you know, folks should be encouraged to report safety violations um, to management or leadership without any, any fear of retribution or retaliation. That that that's the key thing. Um, you know, what's amazing is is it seems like the more people that have near misses that are usually aren't compliant, they they start to kind of get a feeling about them that they're invincible and nothing's ever going to happen to them. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, and all you can do is really hope that, that um, something catastrophic doesn't happen that not only affects them and your facility, but other people as well. Uh, positive reinforcement is a way. Um, I've actually had uh, talked with customers before that have sent people home uh, from work uh, for, for not being compliant, you know, a day without pay. Um, that, you know, there's a real struggle sometimes in the academic segment. I've got the same question from those folks. I always encourage trying positive reinforcement for a good program. I mean, maybe you award something to a lab, uh, maybe a, a, a pizza day or something, I don't know, for, for being the safest lab that's out there. But bottom line, you can't compromise your safety program. If it's, if it's an issue, and especially if it's a serious issue, 
um, the only option may be to write them up, but there, there are um, program enhancements or, or reinforcements that you can make to, uh, to highlight those that, are, that go above and beyond to be safe within the facility. Okay, thanks, Tim. Anything you'd like to add to that, Steve? The positive reinforcement is the is the big key for me. My wife's a teacher, and uh, it's it's astounding how often just positive reinforcement can really turn turn someone around into uh, into being being more aware and uh, being more more interested in 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 staying safe and uh, kind of conforming to the guidelines set by by their managers. So positive reinforcement in a pizza party, I think that could go a long way. <laughs> Everybody loves pizza, right? It's, um, all right. Well, no thank question. you. <laughs> Um, we, we've exhausted all of the questions. I'm just going to close this out, and if we see any additional questions come in, we'll certainly address them. Um, but I'd like to, uh, first of all, uh, mention the fact that, and many of you probably, hopefully you all know, but just in case, um, so at BioNJ, we have a wonderful relationship with Fisher Scientific, where for many years we've engaged in a purchasing uh, consortium collaboration where our members get very significant discounts as a result of doing business with Fisher. So uh, there's the BioNJ commercial, um, and um, and I do hope that uh, that all of you will look into it if you're not already our partners on that front. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning. Again, thank you to Tim and to Steve and to Fisher and to our Bio and J team who makes this happen. Um, if we didn't get to your question, if you or if you think of a question after we uh, release the call, we'll have our speakers address them afterward, and we'll share the answers in a follow-up email with the group. Um, a, a reminder that a recording of this webinar will be available at the Bio and J website at bioandj.org beginning tomorrow. If you're interested in learning about BioNJ membership, Edie Esposito, whose photo is on the, on the screen right now, will be more than happy to connect with you on that. Um, I hope that we'll see many of you at our fifth annual CEO Summit on October 27th. And again, I'd like to thank you all for joining. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.